How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Mr. Donio here again. This time we're going to take a look at some colligative properties. So our objectives will be to explain how various properties of a solution change with concentration, including boiling point, freezing point, osmotic pressure, and vapor pressure. And then we also want to be able to quantitatively determine the degree to which these properties affect. Basically do the math. What is the new vapor pressure? What is the new boiling point? What is the new freezing point? What is the osmotic pressure? All right, so let's start with colligative properties. What is what? What are they? What's up with that? So colligative properties are physical properties of a solution that vary depending on the concentration of the particles dissolved. And I underlined the particles because it depends on how many things it breaks up into, right? So things that are gonna be affected will be the boiling point, the freezing point, the vapor pressure, and the osmotic pressure. So a quick review before we go any for further. Electrolytes versus non-electrolytes. So we know non-electrolytes, they stay as one particle when they dissolve. So for example, I got glucose, C6H12O6. It's a solid, I add it to some water, I dissolve it, I get a solution, but what happened to the molecules? Not a whole lot. We started with one molecule and it stayed as one molecule. So we got one particle for each molecule. But with the electrolytes, they'll break up into particles. So for example, sodium chloride, salt. When we dissolve it in water, it breaks apart. It's NaCl, but then it breaks apart into the Na plus ion and the Cl minus ion. So we really get two particles for every NaCl, right? And if we had CuCl2, it's a similar thing. Instead of getting two particles over, we're getting three. We get one copper plus two ion, and we get two chloride ions. So the more particles there are, the greater effect we're going to have on these colligative properties. So for example, if we had equal concentrations of copper chloride and sodium chloride, copper chloride is going to have a greater effect on the freezing point depression than sodium chloride would. All right, vapor pressure depression. All right, it just means that the vapor pressure of a volatile solvent will be decreased by non-volatile solutes. So we know vapor pressure, we got these liquid particles, they're all moving around. Some of them are gonna go into the vapor phase. Some of the vapors are gonna condense. We get this equilibrium, right? And the pressure from them is the vapor pressure. If we started adding some solutes that want to hang out with the solvent, they're like, hey, no, don't go into the gas phase, stay here, hang out with me, don't go. And we see that the vapor pressure is going to decrease because of that. All right, so the solute kind of holds on to the solvent particles, making the solvent less likely to vaporize, which means you could also think of it this way. If there's more solute, there's less solvent there, which means the vapor pressure should decrease as well. Mathematically, Routes law. We get this, all right, that's the equation. Love it. So the P solution means it's the vapor pressure of the solution, the mixture. The X solvent means it's the mole fraction of the solvent particles in the solution. So remember, uh, mole fraction is gonna be moles of those solvent particles divided by total moles of all the particles. All right, whereas the P naught solvent is the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. So what was it if it didn't have any uh, thing dissolved in it. As you increase the number of solute particles, well, what happens to my mole fraction? My mole fraction is going to decrease, which means, hey, this stayed the same. So the vapor pressure of my solution is also going to decrease, right? So ideal solutions, they obey this law. Just like ideal gases obey PV equals NRT. Ideal solutions follow this P solution equals mole fraction of solvent times the P naught solvent, all right? Not all solutions follow this exactly. Just like ideal gas laws, uh, real gases can behave differently. What example problem? A 0.1 moles of glucose are dissolved into 0.9 moles of water. At a given temperature, pure water has a vapor pressure of 21.5 torr. What would the vapor pressure of water be in this solution? So we go, all right, well, the pressure of the solution is gonna equal the mole fraction of the solvent times the P naught of the solvent. So the mole fraction is, well, how many moles of solute, 0.9, divided by total moles. Well, glucose is a non-electrolyte, so it's 0.1 plus 0.9, then times by 21.5 torr. So when we do that, we get 0.9 divided by essentially 1 times that 21.5 and we end up with 19.35 torr. All right, boiling point elevation. Now that we talked about vapor pressure, let's talk about boiling point. 
we already know that vapor pressure decreases because of dissolved particles. All right, and we also know that boiling point is when the vapor pressure equals the external pressure. So here I have the normal line for the phase diagram. We're saying, hey, since we decreased the vapor pressure, this whole line kind of shifts over, which means if I want to get to the same vapor pressure, I have to get to a higher temperature. All right, so decreased vapor pressure means we need to get the solution even hotter to achieve the same vapor pressure. The boiling point is going to increase. And that difference between what it was and what it is now, we call that the boiling point elevation. So mathematically, this is the equation. The change in the boiling point equals IKBM. And what does all that mean? Well, I is a Van Hoff factor. It's how many fragments does the solute break up into. KB is the molal boiling point elevation constant. M, like written that way, italicized kind of thing, is molality. Remember, molality is moles of solute per kilograms of solvent. Uh, so example problem. What is the boiling point for a two molal solution of NaCl? And they give us the KB for water. So basically we go, hey, all right, the change in my temperature for my boiling point is gonna equal to I. Well, if it's NaCl, it's gonna break up into two ions times I already forgot the equation, Kb, uh, 0.512 degrees Celsius per molal times 2 molal. And when we do that math, we end up with 2.048. Now, that is going to not be our final answer because it wants the boiling point. And what we just found was the change in boiling point. You know that boiling point goes up. So we go, hey, the boiling point of water, our solvent in this example, plus the change gives me the new boiling point, all right? So my new boiling point is 102.048. You gotta watch, are they asking for the actual temperature or the change, all right? So degrees Celsius, there we go. All right, freezing point depression looks a lot like the other equation. All right, so in order to freeze the solvent particles, we need to neatly arrange them into a crystal structure, all right? We go from, hey, liquid phase, they're moving around, they're kind of jumbled, kind of messy, real close together, but we need to get them nice and neat into a crystal structure. Solute particles are gonna make this process more challenging and they require a lower temperature for it to occur. And then here's a look into my, my psyche. Here's an analogy, this is what I think of. So you got a bunch of children running around, right there in the liquid phase, they're running around, flowing past each other, and you ask them, hey, kids, find your seat. All right, let's go, chop, chop, get into your places. That's gonna take a, a certain amount of effort, right? You gotta remove a certain amount of energy. Now let's say you got some solute particles. You throw them into the mix. It's like throwing a bunch of puppies in with those children. All right, so now you got a bunch of children running around and playing with puppies. And you ask them, hey, find your seats. Go find your place, take your seats, get nice and organized. It's gonna be a lot harder because they're like, hey, no, I wanna, I still wanna hang out and play with the puppies. I don't wanna go into the crystal form. I wanna hang out with the puppies, right? So it's gonna be even harder to get them to crystallize. All right, so on a phase diagram, we see that the melting freezing equilibrium is gonna to shift to the left, right? Because the freezing point's gonna drop. And for the boiling point, it's going to shift to the right, right? Um, but talking more about freezing point depression. So this is why they salt the roads in the winter. You know, winter in the Northeast, especially you get ice on the roads, it's hazardous driving conditions. What are we gonna do about it? Well, if we add salt, to the roads, the freezing point of water is gonna drop. So let's say our current conditions are like right here. This is the temperature we're at, normal freezing points up here, uh, which means, hey, we're below the freezing point, we have solid ice on the roads, not good for drivers. We add some salt though, we're going to lower the freezing point. And if we lower it enough that it is now, uh, the new freezing point's lower than the actual temperature, what's gonna to happen to that solid ice? It's gonna melt we're gonna have safer roads to drive on, all right? So the math for this looks a lot like the boiling point. We got the delta TF equals IKFM, right? Delta TF is the freezing point depression. I is the Van Hoff factor. Again, how many particles is it gonna break down into? KF is the molal freezing point depression constant, and M again is molality. So example problem, what is the freezing point of a solution of two molal, of a two molal solution of MgCl2? KF is that. All right, well, again, we go, hey, 
right, if I got MgCl2, my I is going to equal 3. I'm going to get an Mg plus 2 and 2 chloride ions. So my change in temperature of my freezing point is going to be 3 times my Kf, which is 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal, times 2 molal. And when I do that math, I end up with 11.16 degrees. So again, what are they asking me? They want the actual freezing point temperature. This was my change in temperature. I know for water, it's zero degrees Celsius and the freezing point goes down. So I minus 11.16 degrees and I end up with a negative 11.16 degrees Celsius. All right. All right, osmotic pressure, kind of a probably new thing. So diffusion, we know about. It motivates particles to move from where they're in high concentration to where they're in low concentration. But many times in uh, like organic systems, there's a semi-permeable membrane between those two areas. So for example, a cell membrane. Here, right in this diagram, this is where our semi-permeable membrane is. It's gonna let water flow across it in either direction, but these solute particles are too big, it's not gonna happen. They're stuck on that one side. That's semi-permeable. Let some things semi-permeate through. All right, so osmosis is the flow of water across a semi-permeable membrane to an area where it is in lower concentration. So if I'm looking at this diagram, this side is just pure water, so we have a high concentration of water. Well, this side is a solution, so it's a lower concentration of water, which means water is gonna wanna flow from the left side to the right side in this diagram. So what's gonna happen to the water levels on either side? Well, if I have water moving from the left to right, the left side's gonna go down, the right side's gonna go up. And that's what we see, right? We end up with this different um, height on either side. So let's say our system now, instead of this U bend in a glass, it's a red blood cell. All right, we put a red blood cell in an isotonic solution. Iso means the same, tonic means saltiness. So the red blood cell has the same saltiness of its environment. All right, well, let's change the environment. Let's put that red blood cell in a hypotonic solution. So now it's less salty. Well, if it's less salty, that means it's more watery, right? Which means there's more water outside the cell. It's gonna move from areas of high concentration to low concentration. It's gonna move from outside of the cell into, and that cell's gonna get bigger and bigger. All right, if we did the opposite, if we place that red blood cell in a hypertonic solution, hyper means more, so it's more salty. Now, if it's more salty, on the outside, there's less water on the outside, right? Which means the cell is gonna lose water to its environment, that cell is gonna shrink. All right, so this pressure difference, right? I have uh, a semi-permeable membrane, I have water moving from high to low concentration, which changes the height on either side, all right? Which means there's a pressure difference, right? Why doesn't it keep going up? Because gravity is gonna be pulling it down, eventually it's gonna uh, reach an equilibrium. Right, but if we wanted to return these systems to be at the same height, I would have to apply some sort of pressure to the taller side. Now I can, that pressure that I need to apply to get it to level out, that's my osmotic pressure. So mathematically, here, here's our equation, where pi is the osmotic pressure, I is that Van't Hoff factor again, M is molarity, R is the gas constant, and T is the temperature, it's gotta be in Kelvin. So what is the pressure needed to level those two things out? So example problem. The average human body temperature is 98.6 degrees or 37 degrees Celsius. The osmotic pressure of blood at this temperature is 7.65 atmospheres. You're in charge of preparing a glucose IV infusion and need to create a glucose solution that is isotonic with the blood. It needs to have the same osmotic pressure. What molarity will you need? All right, well, I know that pi equals i capital m r t and they're asking me to solve for molarity so let me rearrange i got to divide each side by i r t and i get molarity equals osmotic pressure divided by i r t all right so let me do some plug and chugging 7.65 atmospheres has to equal well if it's glucose it's a non-electrolyte so it's i is one the r value for using atmospheres is 0 0.08206 liter atmosphere per mole Kelvin times the temperature in Kelvin. Well, if it's 37 Celsius, I got to add 273 to that and I end up with 310 Kelvin. So now when I plug and chug, 
beep bop, beep bop, boop, I get 0 0.031 molar as my concentration that I need to make. All right, summarize. Can you explain how various properties of the solution change with concentration, including boiling point, freezing point, osmotic pressure, and vapor pressure? I hope so. Uh, and can you quantitatively determine the degree to which those properties are affected? Can you actually calculate that stuff? And then these are four equations you need to be competent and familiar with. I hope you found that helpful. I'll see you in class. Okay, bye.